Okay. <clears throat> so, Dune. It starts off. Paul Atreides is in the ancestral Atreides stronghold on Caladan, right? He's got his 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 mother, the Lady Jessica, and his father, the Duke Leto, right? Uh Leto is the Duke of House Atreides, which is one of the great houses of the uh, Empire. Uh, kind of part of the lands rot and all that. They just finished a uh, war slash battle against the Harkonnens. And the Empire stepped in and declared it basically over. And as a reward to the Atreides, since they kind of... It's a, it's a little loosey-goosey, but as a reward to the Atreides, they... The Empire is basically... The Emperor is like basically like, hey, I'll, I'll give you... You can have Dune. That's, yeah, that's what you get. And so it opens, and everyone is preparing for the move from Caladan to Dune. And Dune is this... Well, it's called Arrakis. The desert planet, blah, blah, blah. Dune is this incredibly potentially wealthy place that basically you cannot turn down. Fr from from the Duke's perspective, you can't not take Dune. You know what I mean? Because Dune, of course, has the spice. And I'm going to explain this like nobody knows anything. So basically the spice is this catch-all magic material. It uh, sustains human life, so if you consume spice, uh, you will live you can live up to 300 years. Uh, and then it also has a bunch of other properties that I'll get into as they come up. But th it's it's the super. It's basically the most vital thing. Uh, it's the most valuable thing in the entire universe, and only Dune has it. But the thing is, Dune is completely a Dune is a complete desert planet, right? Hence the name. Well, that's that's the kind of colloquial term, that's what the, the, the residents of Arrakis call it Dune, but its actual like empire specific name is Arrakis, of course. But um, that doesn't really matter. I'll, I'll refer to it as Dune from here on out. Uh, I'll change it up later, but that's like three hours from now. Anyway. So, the Atreides are kind of packing up and moving. Paul is talking with Thufir, who is the, uh, the Mentat of the Atreides, the kind of Mentat assassin. Basically, what a Mentat is, is a human computer. They can think real good and real hard. And the reason why they need Mentats is because they don't have computers. And because the, the reason why they don't have computers... Also, I should also establish, Dune takes place like 30,000, like 10,000 years in the future. So we're like, uh, they colonize space. It's, like, it's a fucking space opera. It's, it's, it's yeah, it, it takes a while in the future. But in Dune's universe, way back in the past, there's this thing called the Butlerian Jihad. And this was a base, basically a crusade against thinking machines and so now there's this great uh it's not the great convention but it's like the the lesson of the butler and jihad is that you can never ever make there's this huge uh stigma against uh machines that can think and so all of the machines that they have are very like it's like nothing smarter than like a toaster you know what i mean it's very like specific you push a button and it doesn't otherwise it doesn't do anything it, there's no like ai or anything like that it's all stupid machines that's why they need Mentats, because Mentats can think real good, and they can do, like, accounting and math, and, and uh, because Thufir is, like, a, a Mentat assassin, he can do, like, espionage and, uh, str uh, like, wartime strategy and peacetime strategy, especially with that. That's kind of, like, his main use in this story, as he's like, okay, so this is why, this is why the Emperor is giving us Dune, is because he thinks that we can't handle it, but... There's also this, like, a lot of unsaid stuff that's, like... Because it's all told from mostly from Paul's perspective at the beginning. It's all, like, okay, here's kind of his perspective of what's going on. And everyone is kind of hush-hush about, like, why they're going to Dune, etc., right? So that's kind of the situation that Paul's in at the beginning. Now, the Lady Jessica is another kind of important character because she is uh, not the wife of the Duke, but is his consort, his concubine. Uh, bas but they're deeply madly in love, which is very important. Um, the Duke can't marry Jessica because Jessica is not wealthy, is not of another great house or anything like that, so politically he has to keep himself open to if I'm ever in the situation where I have to 
offer my hand in marriage to someone, to like align two houses, uh, to gain a powerful ally, that option has to be available in the future. I can't just marry someone for love. It's can't very like Game of Thronesy. Very, I mean, it's it's a medieval stereotype. Um, but yeah, so that's where uh, Jessica's relationship with the Duke is. But of course, Jessica loves her son Paul. She actually defied her uh, sisterhood, which is the Bene Gesserit. Now, what's important about the Bene Gesserit, and I'll, I'll kind of explain more as we go along, but for the basic... Uh, th think of them as, like, almost a shadow government. They're incredibly powerful women. Uh, they basically have... Th they're, they're, they're very stigmatized. They're called witches throughout the entire empire uh, because they have these uh, weird abilities that nobody really understands. And th they get kind of more progressively, like, fleshed out throughout the story. But just for the beginning... They're they're very stigmatized. They're witches. They have incredible capabilities in terms of both espionage, charisma, uh, fighting. They're basically like really super powerful. And the Bene Gesserit um, wanted Jessica to have a daughter for the big plans. Like they're like a sh almost a shadow government. I think I said that. So they're kind of like kind of controlling everything through their uh, sisters, their members. And since late the Lady Jessica is. Benny Gesserit, they're like, okay, you should make it. She should have a daughter with the Duke, but of course she betrays it because the Duke really wants a son. Because of course it's a, uh, a it, it's 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 uh, it's like a feudal society, right? You the, the you pass down your titles to your son, your daughter, and so he wants a he wants an heir, direct, and which is a son, and so Jessica has a son. This pisses off the Benny Gesserit, and so the Benny Gesserit send. A uh, what they call a reverend mother, which is basically like a su like uh, one of the highest positions, like like a master of the Benny Gesserit, like r super high position, um, and that's all you need for now. Uh, and so this reverend mother's name is Gaius Helen Mohayim, I think something like that, and she comes and is like, oh, uh, you know, a lot of shit's fucked up right now, and Paul overhears them talking, and. Uh, Gaius Helen Mohayim basically tells Jessica, hey, your your Duke is going to die. Because either, no matter what, he's fucked. You know what I mean? Because like, he goes to Dune. It's basically a trap. The Harkonnens are, 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 are laying in wait. They're going to fuck him up real bad. And Jessica's like, no, that's not true. And then uh, the Reverend Mother's like, oh yeah, it kind of is. And then she's like, anyway, the reason why I'm really here is because I heard that you have a son and have been training him in the Bene Gesserit ways, more or less. And that is a real no-no because a male Bene Gesserit it's called the Quitsack Hatterack, which is uh, incredibly, supposedly incredibly powerful for uh, reasons that will remain unknown for now. Uh, and so she's like, okay, let's go fucking, let's go train or test Paul. And so she tests Paul, which is like a pretty famous scene. Basically, she has this box. And then she's, she asks Paul, she's like, hey, Paul, do you see, do you have dreams that, come true and he's like yes I do I do have dreams that come true and he, he like dreams of like shit in the future basically and she's like okay that's very interesting uh, and now we're gonna test you right and then she's like put your hand in this box and he's like what's in the box and she says pain and he's like uh, uh, why would I do that and then so like he kind of steps forward to do it and she like with because she's Benny Gesserit she's like super super trained and like super fast like ninja you know like real fast not the Fortnite guy, but like a like a, a, a Japanese ninja, and puts puts a, a a knife to his throat, and she's like, "I hold at your throat the Gamja Bar, and what the Gamja Bar is is basically the super duper poison, that if uh, someone pricks you with it, you di you die almost instantaneously, right? That's the whole shtick, and so she's like, "If you take your hand out of the box, I will stab you and kill you immediately," and then uh, there's this like. Uh, famous thing it's like it, an animal if an animal is caught in the trap it will gnaw its own leg off to, sur to survive but a human will lay in wait if it can it will lay in wait and be like okay I I need to to catch and kill this the trapper otherwise he's gonna trap more of my my friends and family you know what I mean and so the, the whole thing is that you like you you're supposed to a human will be able to put aside the pain and keep his hand in the box but a, an animal will give in to its, its basis instincts and pull its hand out of the box, avoiding the pain. All right, and so Paul's hand's in the box, and he's trying real hard, and he's, he's, he's gritting his teeth. He's, he's, he really wants to keep his hand in the box. He doesn't want to die. And so he does, and, it, and like there's a lot of description of, like, oh, it feels like his skin's burning. You can feel the flesh of his skin burn away until it's just bone. And, like, it's super really hyperbolic, in my opinion, but it's whatever. And uh, 
then she's like, that is, that's, that is enough. You can take your hand out of the box. And he takes it out of the box. And his hand is fine, of course. It was just like nerve shit, like poking him or whatever. And then she, uh, she guy is just thinking like, oh, wow, like, you know, we don't even put, you know, Reverend Mothers don't even last that long in the God Jabbar. And then so, of course, she's like, okay, yeah, Paul, you're, you are truly worthy of this training. I don't have to kill you. You can continue to survive. And then Gaius is like, hey, listen, Jessica, you're a real fucking bitch, but you're okay for now, but you're in thin ice. Don't forget. And she's like, okay. And then so Paul has, like, some talks with uh, Gurney Halleck, which is uh, the Atreides, I think, war master or something like that, like the, 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 the general of their army. Uh, and then Thufir, who I said is the Mentat assassin. And they train... And they they train hand to hand because another Im really very important aspect of the world is uh, the weapons. Basically, you have these things called shields, which uh, surround either uh, they can they scale so it's like you can ha have personal shields, which is just your your body, and then all the way up to like planetary shields. So like you can have one over a city, you can have one on, on like a ship, etc. Right? So there's shields. And then there's these other things called las guns. Oh, I should explain what a shield does. A shield will stop anything moving fast, right? So like, personal shields are really useful in like hand, like knife fights because you have to th the the it will deflect a fast blade, but the slow ba blade will penetrate it, right? And so their training is basically like, okay, you have to defend fast but attack slow, which is very important in the future. So like if if you stab if you stab real fast it'll just deflect it'll just bounce right off the shield but if you stab real slow and strong and deliberate it will penetrate the shield and kill the person right and so that's that's the benefit of the shield it will deflect most like bullets and, well, bullets for the most part shit like that but so it's like super useful right that's why like conventional weapons are out that's why like hand to hand combat's really important uh and then on the other side ranged weapons there's this thing called the las gun which is like a, 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 bl a laser blaster basically right but the important thing is if a las gun hits a shield both the las gun and the shield will explode in uh much like a nuclear bomb like an atomic right which also exists in this universe uh, they're called atomics and then there's this thing called the great convention which is basically like if you use atomics to kill people every other entity in the universe will destroy everything you have with their atomics, right? So it's basically like mutually assured destruction. Nobody uses nukes because everybody has nukes, and if you use nukes, they'll nuke you. That's the great convention, right? So nobody uses atomics. Um, but people do use that shield laser gun uh, property a lot, and it's very important. That so that's why like hand-to-hand -hand combat is really important because most... Since these Atreides are like great house, they're they're fairly wealthy, so they equip their sh their troops with shields. And so, th the las guns are basically useless because you you obviously you don't want to explode, and you want you don't you want them to explode, but you don't want to explode in a, in a in a nuclear blast. Right, so it's usually like last resort. <coughs> Fuck. Anyway. Uh. Yeah. So, they go to Dune, basically. So, they're on Dune. They're having some fun. Uh, oh, another character I forgot to mention was the uh, Souk Doctor, Doctor Yui. And basically, a, a, what a Souk Doctor is is they have tattooed right on their forehead a little diamond, which basically says they're Souk trained, which means that they're trained by trained by the Empire, the Emperor. Not the Emperor himself, but like the Emperor like oversees them, like oversees the Souk school. And basically, what it means is he's basically like uncorruptible you know what i mean so he can't be bribed he can't do, like it's he, he he takes like the hippocratic oath to like a billion percent uh supposedly like they shouldn't physically be able to betray whoever they work for right so he's like super trustworthy and loyal to the atreides uh that's another report here anyone else that i miss Duncan Idaho is their sword master, basically. Like, he's real fast with the sword, and he can fly a, a, a thopter, which is like a, a plane, like, but with, like, dragonfly wings. You can fly that real good. Um, but he was sent to Dune early to get in contact with uh, the people who live on Dune, the native people. They're called uh, Fremen, F-R-E-M-E-N. And basically, they live in the deep desert, right? And Leto suspects that they're more powerful, more powerful than they let on. And so he kind of, like, interacts with them. Or he is kind of, like, sent to, like, scout out. 
and like get in contact with their leader and so Leto can kind of talk to them on like like a organization to organization basis rather than like him just talking to a random Fremen or whatever you know what I mean so like th- that's that's what he's doing so he's not really in the book that yet um, but once they get to once they get to Dune they all kind of meet up and they're all like oh yeah he- hell yeah here's here's our defensive plan here's what we're gonna do blah 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 right and then they like talk to talk to uh and talk to uh, this person called Liet Kynes, and what they, who Liet Kynes is, he's basically um, the planetary environmentalist, but he, he prefers the old term planetologist. <coughs> basically, they're supposed to keep the, the planet in, like, sustainable for humans, make sure there's enough plant life to make the oxygen breathable. But Dune is special, of course, because it's all Dune, it's all desert, uh, so it is what it is. Uh, then there's a lot of cool little shit that I won't really get into because it's fucking insane. But there's a lot of little cool little details about like how water is super impor- um, important, of course. And the Fremen have these things called still suits, which basically encompass their entire body and collect the sweat and shit and piss and distill it down into just water where you can sip it back out. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, that's basically it for the main characters. Uh, the stage is set. I'll just fucking skip forward because I want to get this done pretty quick. Uh, so they're fucking, they're doing it up. They're fucking making friends. They're doing pretty good. It seems that they're, they have a very strategic position. Almost can't be, like, they, they keep saying, it's like, oh, it's, a, it's an incredible defensive position. Oh, and then there's this, uh, a letter is found. That it's like, there's a betrayer amongst you, Right. And it, it, that's really important because, like, everyone's like, that's the only, the only possible, our, def- our defensive position is so good and our plans are so thorough that the only way that it can go wrong is if someone on our side betrays us and gives, the, gives us, us t- up to the uh, Harkonnens, right? And so everyone's kind of, like, thinking, like, who is the, who's going to betray us? Who's going to fucking backstab us? And then there's this letter that, like, points to Lady Jessica being the betrayer. And so Thufir, uh, Gurney, and... Um, a little bit of Duncan are like, oh shit, maybe fucking Jessica is the betrayer. But the Duke is like, Leto's like, of course not. What the fuck is wrong with you? Of course it's not Jessica. She loves the shit out of me. I'm a, I'm a motherfucker. And uh, he tells this to Paul, and then Paul's, and then he's like, listen, you got to play along because like, we got to see who the real traitor is. So, like, the, if the real traitor will lower their guard if we think it's Jessica, because then they can do, like do more shit. Um. Uh, let's see. There's a cool, cool little scene where uh, Duncan gets drunk. Well, Duncan's assigned to watch to basically spy on Jessica, and then he gets drunk off of sp- spice beer or something, and like come barges in and and basically says to Jessica's face, "I think you're a traitor." And so Jessica knows that people suspect her. And s- but since she's like Benny Jesuit, she li- she's like perfectly composed and like gets out of the situation almost perfectly. Blah 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 blah. Um, what happens next? I guess I can just skip forward to the actual thing. So it turns out that Doctor Yui is of course the betrayer. The Harkonnens have his wife, uh, and they're like, "Oh hell yeah!" So I'm gonna fucking c- I'm gonna kill your wife. I'm gonna keep torturing your wife unless you bring me Leto, right? And so Yui's like, I I gotta fucking do it. So he goes in, he destroys all the shield generators or whatever the fuck. So the shields go down. The Harkonnens come in with like, uh, this is important, the Harkonnens come in with Sardaukar, right? And the Sardaukar are basically the Emperor's own army. And so this is is a huge revelation because it's like the, the Empire itself is against Detraides and if anyone finds out, Everyone will go against the emperor, right? So it's it's this is really important. But but the Sardaukar are dressed as Harkonnens. So from everybody's outside perspective, it's just the Harkonnens coming in, which is like perfectly quote unquote legal. It's like part of like the house battle system. Is like like you have to like if you have enough troops, you can just go in and take shit. Anyway, so it's it's like it's like legitimate. That the Harkonnens just take over, and so the Harkonnens come in with Sardaukar, and just completely overwhelm the Atreides. They fuck it up real bad. Uh, Yui turned off the generators, and then he shoots uh, Leto with uh, a paralyzing like dart gun or whatever that keeps him conscious, and he can move his eyes and shit, but he can't move anything else. And then um, 
he's like, okay, what I'm going to do, and then he reaches into his mouth, pulls out one of his molars, and then he's like, and then he holds up another molar, and he's like, this is, this is a capsule full of poison. When you bite down on this, it will release a poisonous gas. I need you to blow this in the face of the Baron Harkonnen, who's the, like, the head, the head of the, Baron Vladimir Harkonnen is the head of the Harkonnens, obviously. And obviously, Yui hates him because he's torturing his wife. And so Yui's like, I'm, I need you to, uh, when the Baron gets close enough, I'm, I need you to bite down on this tooth and spray the gas in his face. And then he puts the tooth in, like, and since he's a soup doctor, he's like an ultimate doctor, so he puts in the tooth, and it's like perfectly, like, you can't tell the difference. Um, and it's like, it's explained, it's like, oh, he's the motherfucking best, and obviously any test is going to tend to negative, because he's the best. And so, Yui brings the Duke to Baron Harkonnen. Oh, I should also say, Yui planned uh, an escape for Jessica and Paul, and they meet up with Duncan Idaho, and they fly away for now. Um, after, like, the initial attack, they get away. Right, so it's Duncan, Paul, and Jessica. Paul and Jessica have... All, all three of them have, like, enough to survive in the dead. They all have still suits. They all have, like, water, like, a decent amount of water. Um, they're pretty, they're pretty set, more or less. They're not, like, in incredible amounts of danger. But, uh, let's see. Let's, let's focus on the Duke for now. And so, the Duke is brought to the Baron. And the Baron's like, ah, it's the Duke. I can't wait to fucking get you to tell me all your secrets. And at this point, the Duke th thinks Jessica's dead because uh, the Baron thinks Jessica and Paul are dead. And so the Duke's like, okay, so my entire shit is fucked. I might as well just die here. And so he bites down on the tooth and blows it in Harkonnen's face. Harkonnen reels away quick enough and closes and seals a door with all of his men inside. So all of his men inside die, but he lives. And he's kind of like scarred because he's like, oh shit, that was so fucking close. So he he could have got, he just, I, just, I almost just got got. You know what I mean? So, uh, the Duke dies, which fucking sucks, but it is what it is. And so now Paul is technically the Duke. Oh, and also another thing, Paul has, uh, the Duke's, uh, s uh, insignia ring, which is really important. It's got like the, the Atreides, uh, crest, the, the hawk of Atreides on it. And so like that, like kind of signals that he is Paul, you know what I mean? Cause like only Paul or the Duke would have it and the Duke is dead. And so this is Paul. Um, and so the Duncan, Jessica, and Paul go to Liet Kynes. He has like a secret like observatory, basically. And so they go to him. And so Liet's like, "Oh shit! I normally wouldn't, you know, help you guys because obviously the Harkonnens are have fucked you in the ass." But of course. Paul and Jessica are both so fucking charismatic and convincing as leaders that he's like, well, shit, now I gotta, you know, you're obviously the leader that we need. Um, <coughs> uh, and so he likes, um, he's like, okay, I'll help you. And so he helps him escape, but Duncan has to stay back because the starter car find them, and then Duncan stays behind, um, and like uh, kills like twenty starter car, but then he dies, and Paul's real sad about it, and he's like, "Oh no, my best friend Duncan's dead," and then he, they fly away. Well, I should uh, it was pretty. It's pretty climactic. They uh, they both get in a thopter, and then they fly into a desert storm, which is like famous for being un uncrossable. But uh, Liet Kynes is basically like, "Hey, uh, if you fly real fast and real high." you can you can survive the dust storm and so they do and then they do um and then they land and they're like oh shit where do we where do we go now and so basically they're a little aimless um and then we'll cut back Leah Kynes is captured by the Baron is killed by the Baron um I think that's basically it for that side of the story oh Yui's also killed because his wife was already dead um most of Baron's men are killed Baron, the, the Baron had this, uh, what, that's not important. Anyway. So, uh, Jessica and Paul are just chilling in the desert. They're like, oh, fuck, now what? And so they're, like, they're, like, taking inventory, and they're like, okay, we got this and this and this. Oh, another thing I forgot to mention. Uh, the worms. That's probably pretty important. So, in the open desert, 
there's these big ass sandworms that can crawl through the sand and if you walk with anything with a rhythm it will attract the worm right and so they uh, have to cross this big open part of the desert from one like stone crop outcropping to another and and to do so they have this thing called a thumper and what a thumper does is basically just it thumps it in it, it makes a, a a deep low rumbling rhythm like bop 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 you know what i mean and, and draws in worms and then jessica and paul walk without rhythm to the other to the other outcropping and they, they it's like it cuts it real close but they, they get there and then they're like oh shit now what the fuck are we gonna do and it's like it's like nighttime it's very dark because of course in daytime the desert's really hot so they travel at night um And then, what else? What happens next? Oh, that's right. And then they encounter Fremen. Uh, Stilgar's little CH, uh, like, scout group, basically. Um, what's important is there's Stilgar, Janus, and Chaney. Chaney is uh, the girl that Paul has been seeing in his dreams. And so he's like, oh, fuck, I've seen you before. Uh, Jessica... Um, beats the fuck out of them basically and is like and then everyone's like oh shit you you know the weirding way and Jessica's like hell yeah hell yes I, I, I do I do know the weirding way you know because um oh Jesus Christ this is going all over the place but basically the Bene Gesserit have this thing called the Missionaria Protectiva which basically means they've th that uh, since they are so the Bene Gesserit are so ancient that uh, way back in the day they went out to all of the all of these, all of the people, and planted little, um, like seeds, of like, oh, here's, of like, of like, basically little religions, right? And basically, they're like, okay, here's, if if a woman comes to you that is exactly like this and says these exact words, they're like the Messiah, and you shouldn't kill them. And so that that's what happened here, and uh, somehow that translated to, there's a woman like that who has a teenage son who was like cool as fuck and so this like it like when when they first got to doing this like really fucked up paul because he's like why they see me as some sort of messiah um and then jessica couldn't didn't say anything i, I, I don't remember how that reaction it, who gives a fuck anyway so now they're like oh shit it's this weirding woman who has a teenage son right uh and so like this is like prophesized and there's a whole lot of rituals that jessica has memorized and so she can, like, spit out the words that they expect right away. And so they're like, oh, shit, you're cool as fuck, right? And so they bring them back to, to uh, uh, what's called C.H. Tabor. It's, like, a basically a, a cave that they, like, had made a home. They have, like, like, carpet and shit on the walls to make it look okay. And it's where, this, it's where the Fremen live. Uh, and then the guy named Janus is, like, I, I challenge Paul and then... Everyone's like, what the fuck? And then Jessica's like, oh shit, I forgot about this or whatever. I forgot if she knew about this. But like, basically, it's like uh, the, the, this Messiah teenage boy can, is supposed to be like better than any of them at fighting. And so Janus thinks that this is all bullshit. He doesn't think that these two people are from the prophecy. And so he's like, I challenge the boy. And if I kill him, I get all the water that they have. Because they have like two liters of, wa of water. And which is like a lot of money, apparently. Well, obviously, because fucking dude and uh um yeah so they fight and paul um this is where the fucking knife fighting comes in since they both don't have shields oh because shields are uh, are basically really shit in arrakis because shields draw worms like a mother like shields draw worms almost instant like way better than a thumper um but of course they're way more expensive so they it's not used for that at least now uh, and then, fuck, let's see, what's next? Uh, yeah, so Paul and Janus fight, they, neither of them have shields, but Paul is used to fighting with shields, and so it seems like he's playing with Janus, because he's defending, like, lightning fast, but he's attacking fairly slowly, enough that, like, Janus can counter, or, like, hop away, or whatever, as so everyone's like, oh, he's playing with him, what, that's a, that's a stupid bitch, you know, like, that's, that's really fucked up for him to do, but, uh, Jessica's like, no, he's, he's, he's fucking trying his heart out. And so eventually Paul kills Janus. And everyone's like, yo, that was, you were such an asshole. And then Paul's like, I 
I've never killed anyone before. And everyone's like, you liar. Of course you have. You're playing with him. And then Paul cries because he's like, I've never killed someone before. I took someone in his life, blah, 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 blah. And of course, crying in Fremen culture is really, really, really sacred because you're wasting water, basically, right? Which is really obviously important. Uh, and so he cries. He, he quote-unquote gives water to Jason. 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 I already forgot. Whatever. Uh, this other guy. And, uh, yep, he's basically accepted of the tribe. He's given, he chooses the name Wadib. That's his, like, tribal name. Uh, it means, like, a little mouse that jumps or something. Uh, and then his secret, uh, um, that, so it's, Muad'Dib is like his Fremen name, and then his secret tribal name that only these people know is Usul, which basically means like, uh, a sturdy pillar or foundation or something like that, because th they're like, oh shit, we can like build something off of you, because, uh, Jessica and Paul are like, oh yeah, we can train people in our weirding way, and so like, you can be a really good fighter, and of course the Fremen are already like top tier fighters, because the Fremen can basically go toe to toe with the Sardaukar, which is like on unprecedented, because they're like, oh shit, these Fremen are actually motherfuckers, and, and so if you teach the Fremen the quote-unquote weirding way, the Benny Jesuit fighting techniques, then they become, you know, even better, and, like, Paul is like, oh, shit, I can become the leader of these people and lead them against the Sardaukar and Harkonnens and reclaim my uh, title of the Duke of Arrakis Dune, right? Uh, so that's basically the first half of the book. That's probably where, whatever, um, that's the first half of the book. Uh, cut to, like, two years later, uh, the Harkonnens are dealing with some inside shit. I'm not going to fucking get into it, but basically, uh, the Baron has a nephew called Fade Reltha, and also another nephew, or a son, I forgot, called, um, fuck, what was his name? It doesn't matter. He's like a brute, and he's put in charge of Arrakis, basically. So the plan is, okay, we got this dumb bitch who was way too harsh. What is it? God damn it, I gotta fucking Google this right quick. Uh, Baron... Uh, Dune. Oh, here we go. Uh, we got. It's like the butcher or something like that. The beast Raban, of course. Yep. Okay. So, uh, the beast Raban is is kind of put in charge of Dune, and the Baron is like, "Hey, we need." as much spice as possible, so you should be an absolute asshole to all the people there. And so the Beast Raban is, like, is being a real dick, like, he's executing people who are too slow, and, like, he's really cracking down on the Fremen and trying to kill every single one of them, because he... There's a, there's a, a very slight suspicion that the Paul got away into the Fremen people, because there's, like, mutterings of, like, there's this, like, uh, small little boy, <laughs> a, a, a teenager, uh, like, grouping the Fremen together and, like, kind of guiding them in, into a single organization rather than a bunch of small little tribes. And so that's that. Um, Gordy Halleck got away, surprisingly. He's just chilling with a bunch of uh, uh, smugglers, because the smugglers uh, just basically steal a very small amount of spice and bring it and sell it for a lot of money. Uh, so it's kind of like underground. Um, so that's what Gurney's doing. Uh, Duncan's dead. Fucking the Baron. I already said that. Uh, so yeah, basically the stage is set. So Paul is like eating spice, and he's I haven't even talked about this yet, but he's he's getting uh, prescience. Basically, like he can see the future. Um, and then he's like, okay, so here's the shit. And then um, oh, I forgot another, I forgot another important part. So um, the Lady Jessica meets. Uh, for I think it, I think they're just straight up called Reverend Mothers, in um, Fremen culture. And there is this Reverend Mother there, who's like, "Oh, you're you're also a Benny Jesuit. You should. I'm I'm I'm, I'm like 400 years old or something. I'm old as fuck. I'm gonna die. I need you to become the new Reverend Mother, and go through this thing called the agony, the spice agony, right? And basically, it means like, okay, here you eat. You basically drink a poison." which sets your body up in such a way that it unlocks all f all of your female memories, right? And so you remember every single female, like, basically your consciousness is now possesses the consciousness of all of your female ancestors, which is why the Reverend Mothers are so powerful and so strong and so single-minded, because they, they all kind of have this, this collective path that they can access. 
and like ask questions and shit. And so uh, she goes through that and she does it. Um, it's not really important why, but yeah, she does it. How long has this been fucking going on for? Oh my god, fucking 35 minutes. Jesus Christ. I'm not even through Dune yet. Fuck my dick. Alright. Um, I gotta... Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing okay. Uh, so they do this, basically, right? And, uh... They're going through, and, like, shit's happening. Paul is, like, becoming a leader of all the Fremen, because he's, like, he's, like, stronger and faster and better than all of them, and smarter, and all that, you know? So he's, like, obviously becoming a natural-born leader. And he, he, he keeps saying that they're, like, he's their duke. He's, like, the rightful leader of Arrakis, and should take power away from the Beast Reborn. And, of course, everyone hates the Beast Reborn because he's being a real asshole. And so they're like, hell yeah. And so there's been, like, a lot of, like, almost guerrilla warfare. There's a lot of, like, sabotage that's going on. All the Fremen are, like... And then, like, the tactics are um, changing. And Gurney... There's, a like, a small little chapter that Gurney's like, oh, shit, this is, like, something that Paul would do. But obviously Paul's dead. You know? Anyway. Back to Paul. Paul um, does a lot of... Like, he's, like, ingratiated fully into the Fremen, basically. He... Um, he rides a worm. The Fremen can do that. They can, like, control the worm and stuff like that. They call him, like, Shai Halud. He's, like, their god or whatever, but that doesn't really matter. Um, at least for now. Um, what else? What else? What else? Uh, he meets up with Gurney Halleck. Uh, they're friends again. Gurney still thinks that Jessica betrayed them, and he's like, oh, fuck, Paul doesn't know that Jessica betrayed them. Uh, Paul confronts Jessica, but then, or, fucking, uh, Gurney confronts Jessica, and then Jessica's like, obviously it wasn't me, it was Yui. And that's like a, an important thing, but that's not really important. Um, what else? Paul becomes the de facto leader. He uh, kind of uh, peacefully usurps Stilgar's role. Stilgar being the leader of the Fremen, basically. And so he's like, I'm now the leader of the Fremen, because I'm the Duke. But you can still be kind of like the, the, the head of the CH, the head of like the Fremen uh, side of the shit. Uh, yep, and then, uh, they're, like, planning this big siege on, like, the main city of Arrakis, uh, like, where the, the, where the motherfuckers are, <laughs> the Harkonnens, and then Paul's like, oh, shit, it's like, we're doing this in, like, three weeks, I got time, and so he goes, and he, he goes through the spice agony, which is unprecedented, uh, every male who's tried to do the spice agony has died, um, Paul, of course, lives, and he becomes what's known to the Bene Gesserit as the Quetzal Cataract, a male reverend mother. And he has access to both the male and the female uh, sides of his past. And he also has access to unprecedented prescience, meaning that he can see basically see the future. And um, basically what the Quetzal Cataract's main power is, is that he can see... He, he, I think Quetzal Cataract means like, like can be in many places. Basically he sees all of the present. And he sees that there's a bunch of... Uh, ships out in space and the uh, the emperor emperor's there right and so he's like okay we need to now is like the perfect time to attack and so he, so he devises this perfect fucking plan he goes in he uses uh, the, the main cities of Arrakis are built around this thing called the shield wall which is basically a big like stone structure uh, mm -hmm. like a natural stone structure and so he goes and he uses, he smuggles atomics away from the Harkonnens and uses atomics to destroy the structure, which is unprecedented because nobody uses atomics, but as in a, in a loophole, the atomics weren't used to kill people, therefore it doesn't break the Great Convention. Um, he goes in, there's a big old st dust storm, and so everyone, everything's chaotic. There's the, all the electronics are not working because they have like radios and shit. Um, so all that's kind of knocked out. And then he leads his Fremen in. All of the Fremen kind of go in riding a bunch of worms. And so they go in, and then the Fremen are fucking murdering all the starter car, and they're fighting real hard. And then Paul basically just walks in. Oh my fucking Christ, I forgot about Aaliyah. Fuck my dick. Okay. Okay, let me fucking backtrack a lot. Alright, number one. Paul and, Ch Paul and Chaney are together. They're, like, married, basically. Um, I shouldn't say, but they're, like, Fremen married, but not, like, obviously they, like, sign anything. But they have a kid. They call him Leto, a son. And then, uh... Uh, Jessica was actually pregnant when Leto died, right? And she went through the agony while pregnant, which is a big no-no, because that made the baby also aware of all of their ancestors' memories, right? So the baby is born and uh, is what 
the Bene Gesserit call an abomination, right? Basically born with full awareness, right? So it's like looking around and being like, oh yeah, that's you, and it can it, it tries to talk, but of course it has a baby palate. And so after the two year, two or three years, it's like it's like three or four years old or something like that. It can like walk around and stuff, and it can kind of talk. And like everyone thinks it's really weird because it's like it, it like talks like a, a grown woman would. It like makes dick jokes and stuff. It's hilarious. Um, but it's like two years old, so it's like waddling about and, and talking with like a bit of a lisp. But um, um. So that's Aaliyah. So Aaliyah was captured before. So like they go, and so of, like they leave all of the 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 old and and like Jessica and all the, all of the weak, old weak and and most of the women behind, while they go attack this main city. Uh, it turns out the Sardaukar figured out where they were and went in after they left and took a lot of hostages, mainly Aaliyah. Oh, and they killed uh, Paul's son. Uh, so Leto's dead again. <laughs> uh, and then uh, Paul's like, oh, fuck, I, I knew that was going to happen, you know, but it, it, it was unavoidable. And then so they go in, they basically fuck up all of the Har- all of the Sardaukar and all the Harkonnen shit. They, they, like, incredibly decisively destroy them. Um... Fuck what else? And then and then uh, Aaliyah kills the Baron because nobody expects like a two year old to be able to wield a knife. Uh, so she fucking stabs him. Well, she hits him with like a gamja bar, so it's not like a fucking. Anyway, um, so the Baron's dead, and then Paul like walks in there like a motherfucker. He's like, "Hey, what's up? It's it's me." And then uh, Fade Ralph challenges Paul to a knife fight. Uh, Paul wins. Of course, and then and then Paul's like, "Hey, instead of uh, me killing all of you right now, how about I marry your daughter?" To the, he says this to the emperor. How about I marry your daughter? Because the emperor only has daughters. Because he's also married to a Bene Gesserit, and his Bene Gesserit wife only gives him daughters. Because that's like what she's supposed to do. Jessica's an outlier in terms of defying the sisterhood, um, and so she's like, "Okay." Uh, and, and then the emperor's like, well, why the fuck would I do that? Cause he's like, and then he's like, I'm going to kill you. I have a knife to your throat, my man. I can kill you right now if you want. And he's like, oh, shit, you're right. And so Paul is married to the princess Irlan. Um, and so and he becomes the emperor of the universe, right? And that's basically the end of, end, end of the book. Uh, he's got his little sister, Leah, and his wife, Chaney. And he's married to fucking Irlan. That's Dune. <coughs> fuck. All right, let's move on to Dune Messiah. All right, Dune Messiah. Now, actually, here, let me order a fucking pizza because goddamn, I'm hungry. Okay, let me get... Oh, wait, here, let me... A thin crust, yeah. Let's get some fucking. Let's get some banana peppers on there. And then let's do fucking chicken. Perfect. Alright, no. And then. Uh. Yeah, that's all I need. Okay. <laughs> Dune Messiah. <coughs> so, Dune Messiah takes place about... Mm, I don't know how long, but uh, fairly long. I think like 12 or 15 years after. Here, let me fucking search it. Dune Messiah. I think it's 12. That sounds right. Yep, 12 years. Okay. So Ali is like 15 or so. Um, yeah. And then uh, Paul's like 30 or something. 
uh, their empire is going pretty well. Well, actually, it's it's, it's not go it's not going well. Uh, it's it's basically stagnating. Um, they're having a lot of like problems because like all of their old like because they basically t oh shit I should probably let's okay number one uh they're, like I said they're stagnating. They're kind of letting their enemies grow stronger, and I should cl I should clarify what the who the enemies are. Um, so. Number one, the Bene Gesserit, right? The Bene Gesserit hate Paul and Jessica because Jessica, of course, betrayed them to have a son, and then Paul is like the Quetzal Cataract, which they uh, don't like because they don't they can't control him. Um, and then, uh, so that's one enemy, right? The other enemy is the Guild, and I never I should have explained this a little bit more in, in the first Dune, but. The guild are, is basically, uh, sorry, I'm just really close to ordering this Domino's, I don't really want it right now. Uh, yeah, that's fine. So the guild are the, they have a monopoly on space travel. Uh... They have a monopoly on space travel. Only they can can travel through space. Uh, so that's the guild. That's the Bene Gesserit. Um, the House Carino, which is the previous empire emperor, which is a uh, um, princess Irlan, or I guess Lady Irlan now. She's like she's like the queen or whatever the fuck. She is a uh, part of House Carino, and so she's kind of part of this this uh, conspiracy. And then there's a couple new players. Um, well, I think just one new player. I don't think Ix is really involved yet. So this is uh, this is uh, people called the Tleilax from uh, Tleilaxu, and basically what their speciality is is uh, genetics. Uh, they have these things called uh, these people called face dancers, right? Who is basically like changelings from uh, like from D and D, um, or like Odo from Star Trek. Like they can change into any person. Um, Yep, so there it kind of opens up and like they're having a big old meeting they're like okay so how do we kill uh Muad'Dib because that's kind of Paul's like Paul's kind of become like a religious figure of the entire galaxy. Um everyone kind of sees him as Muad'Dib and so there's these big and like uh they also see Aaliyah as is this sort of uh religious figure. Jessica's kind of out of it cuz she's like I don't like what this is happening. I don't think I don't like what you've become. And so she leaves, she goes back to Calia and she's just kind of hanging out with Gurney. Um and the Tleilax basically have this hmm. ability to create these things called golas, right? Excuse me. And what a gola is, is they take the cells of a dead body, and they can basically make a clone of it. And this clone will have no memories, no, like, conscious memories, but it will have subconscious memories, which is weird. But basically, like, because, like, say, example, someone is super good at, like, at sword fighting. They die. And then they make a gola of that person. That gola will be super good at sword fighting. You know what I mean? It's like it's like muscle memory and like like very subconscious training that they received that they will remember. So they make a gola of Duncan Idaho. And because this is not Duncan Idaho, it's a different person. Uh, the gola names itself Hate H A Y T, which is very important. And so, basically, at the beginning, they're like, oh, yeah, we have this, this method of bringing down... We can't destroy Muad'Dib uh, through any direct means. We don't have the power. He, like, he's too powerful. He's prescient, so he can see the future, basically. And so, like, okay, so what's going to happen is... Uh, well, okay, so fucking... There's a guild navigator there, which is basically, like... So... <sighs> fuck me. Goddamn, there's so much fucking shit to explain. So the guild, it turns out need spice to function basically the reason why they have the monopoly on space travel is because sp space travel is impossible without some form of very weak prescience right basically to say okay is this course safe for this ship to travel 
and then they they look into the feature and say yes or no, and then if it's yes, they just go. You know what I mean? That's so they're called guild navigators, right? And they're like um, super fucked up because they live their entire lives as an ROG, so they have like really long arms and really long legs, and they can't like walk, so they have to live in like no G in zero G uh, tanks, and they are basically surrounded with the spice twenty four seven, right? Because the spice grants the guild navigators prescience, and then I should also say it gives the Benny Jesuit. Uh, their ability to, to see their past lives. Right, that's, uh, hence the spice agony, right? So, <coughs> the guild is, is doesn't like that the Atreides Paul has complete a uh, complete monopoly on the spice. The Bene Gesserit don't like that they have a complete monopoly on the spice. The Tleilax just hate him because I, I don't remember. And then Irlan hates him because, well, House Carino hates him because they usurp them, basically. And so they got all these forces going against him. Uh, Paul is kind of, like, stagnating. He's like, what's my true purpose? You know, what the fuck? Well, he's basically, like, a big thing in Dune 1 was that it, uh, Paul was trying to prevent this great jihad that he, he saw in the future. Basically, he's like, all, all, like, billions of trillions of people are going to die beneath the flag of Atreides, right? But turns out that was unavoidable that's like the conclusion of the book is like oh shit this jihad was going to happen with or without me and so i might as well fucking control it so i can kind of minimize it as much as possible and so what basically happens is the fremen are finally allowed to leave the planet since they're kind of they were they were always in hiding now they're not and so now they're kind of exploding they're going into the every planet and being like okay you have to change your religion to the religion of Muad'Dib, otherwise we're going to kill you, right? There's this great religious jihad where all the Fremen go out, and they subjugate every single planet. Right, and uh, that's going on. Um, let's see, Paul and Chaney are fucking, they're trying to have a kid, of course, because Paul doesn't have an heir, because uh, his previous child died, the Sardaukar killed him, and he knows that Chaney can't have a kid because Irulan is giving Chaney uh, like birth control or whatever, so she can't have a kid, uh, and then, <laughs> fuck, and then, uh, so Dune Messiah is really different from, the rest of the books are really different from Dune, Dune is very, uh, action-packed and very, like, Star Wars-y, uh, Dune Messiah and Onward is very, uh, not s maybe not slower, is slower. That's a, that's weak. Maybe more philosophical, more like more like chess, where all the pl all the, uh, most of the book is is set up is is like putting characters in the right places and like getting the reader to understand their moods. And then at the like at crucial points, there's like a lot of action. I guess that's kind of what Dune was like, but like it, it's w it's way more prominent in these books. Um, and so it's kind of setting up like Paul is like at this very crux he's like he's stagnating and he is basically refusing to see the future because he doesn't want to face it um but finally he does and he kind of like has this incredible breakthrough that he's like oh shit this is exactly what has to happen and then so like uh the Tleilax send in a face dancer and they're like oh yeah uh, it's me this the daughter of this guy that you know and then Paul's like oh so this is obviously a face dancer but Paul goes along with it because he's like, I need, we need more information. Well, we quote unquote need more information, and so he goes to this thing that's basically a trap. And then as he's leaving, this uh, this planted thing called a, a stone burner uh, goes off. It basically, it's an atomic weapon. It it burns deep into the ground. If it's strong enough, it will burrow so deep that it will destroy the crust of the planet and basically that'll lead to like volcanoes going off everywhere and the planet is destroyed. But of course they don't do that. But a secondary reaction of the stone, thro stone burner is that it puts off radiation that tar specifically targets the human eye tissue. And so everyone within like 30 miles of that stone, thro st stone burner, their eyes melt basically, which includes Paul. Right, so pa Paul's eyes melt. And everyone's like distraught because it's like, oh shit, Paul is blind. It, that's like any disability uh like the fremen tradition is to just basically leave them or, or like it's like because like if you if you turn blind somehow the, the what you're supposed to do in fremen tradition is just walk into the desert because like you're you you offer nothing to the tribe anymore to the sketch and so like your water is worthless and so you're supposed to just leave 
because like you eating food and drinking water and shit is <coughs> just a waste. And so everyone's really upset. Oh, another thing is uh, the Duncan Idaho Gola has uh, fake eyes. Th those exist. Uh, but the Fremen hate that because they, they don't like technology. They think they should, everything should be natural or whatever. It's, this is a heavy... All of fucking what I'm saying is a heavy simplification. This would be like eight hours if I didn't. But uh, Paul immediately is gifted... So Paul is gifted hate before his eyes burn. And he's like, oh shit, this is obviously a trap. They're obviously trying to kill me with this guy. But the thing is, they didn't program hate with any sort of malice towards Paul. They're just like, okay, here's this. The idea behind it is that like this thing would get Paul to see that he should kill himself, which is a weird little thing, but like that's you know what it is. Uh, so they do that, and then Paul gets his eyes burned out. But since he's kind of had this revelation about the future, he now knows the future down to every single mi like moment. And then, so he's like, okay, here, I know exactly what's going to happen. So he doesn't even need his eyes. He like He's looking at people, pointing at people, and being like, you go here, you go here. Oh, yes, it's you, of course. Hello, Stilgar, you're back. And, like, both his, like, eyes are, like, melting down his face, and everyone's, like, really weirded out by this, of course. Um, uh, yeah, so that's basically one of my favorite parts of the book. Um, Paul's gone, like, all Super Saiyan. He he sees the future perfectly. Uh, yeah. What's next? Uh, Ali is kind of hanging out. Not really doing much. Not really important yet. Uh, yep. Oh, uh, uh, Paul and Cheney. Paul gets Irlan to stop giving Cheney birth control, so that Cheney gets pregnant, and Cheney is like having insane birth like, pregnancy cravings or whatever the fuck, but, like, it tur like she needs, like, a shit ton of spice, and so she's eating, like, eight times more spice than normal or whatever. And then Paul's like, okay, I'm gonna have a... Uh, I'm gonna have a son. Because he can see the future, and he's like, okay, so here's what's gonna happen. Oh, uh, oh, shit, actually, so Gurney was... Oh, Gurney, fuck off. Uh, the Duncan Gola was programmed with a kill command. Basically, like, once, um... Once Paul says a specific phrase, uh, the goal is supposed to kill him. I completely forgot about this. Um, and so they go back to C.H. Tabor, where they met, basically, because uh, Cheney's uh, going to give birth there. And so they go back, and then Paul knows that Cheney's going to die giving, giving birth. And then he uh, uh, does that. And then he says the phrase to the Duncan Idaho Gola. And basically, uh, Duncan tries to, uh, the Duncan Gola tries, hate tries to kill Paul, but he can't because Duncan, Duncan's history is basically like he was saved by the Atreides from Harkonnen slavery. And so he has this very intense, uh, loyalty towards the Atreides, and so he could never k kill an Atreides, that's, but he has that on like a subconscious level, and so that breaks kind of the Gola stance, and so now he is, he, he now, his memory is now flooded with Duncan Idaho's memories, so he is now in, uh, basically every single form, he is now Duncan, reborn, right, which is very important, so now you got Duncan Idaho, you got Paul, uh, they rush in because Cheney just gave birth, and then they're like, oh, congratulations, Paul, you have twins. And Paul's like, what the fuck, I have twins? Because in his, in his vision, he saw only a son. And so he's like, holy shit, my vision can be changed. This is very, very good. And now he thinks to himself, I need, I need to give both of these kids every advantage. And I'm kind of losing the Fremen. Because during this whole book, basically, there's a, a conflict of like, all of these, all of those outside of the guild, uh, the Bene Gesserit, the Tleilex, and the uh, the Carinos are all fighting against him, and they're also turning, slowly turning Fremen against him, because uh, 
Paul is kind of leaning more towards being an emperor rather than leading the Fremen in kind of like the traditional ways, right? So the Fremen are sort of against him. And so, and since the Fremen are like basically the muscle of the Atreides Empire, he kind of lean has to lean more towards the the Fremen. And so, what he does is he just walks into the desert. That's the end of a uh, dude Messiah Paul, blind, unable to see the future anymore, just walks into the desert because uh, the future basically breaks when he had twins instead of just a son. So the future breaks. Paul's like, oh shit, I gotta, I gotta leave a legacy, and so he just leaves. And so that's super legendary. Uh, and that's the end of Dune, Messiah. I'm going to go piss. I'll be right back. To talk about Children of Dune. Uh, actually, here, yeah. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. So, another thing I forgot to mention was that Paul's two kids are abomination. They're ba they're born with uh, ancestral memory and they're fully aware. So, uh, that is why Chaney needed so much spice when she was pregnant. It's because she had abominations. Nobody really knows why. Mostly they think because it's Paul's kids and since Paul is the Quitsec Hatterak, his kids have to be super duper special. So, that's that. So his kids are uh, prescient. So let's change this guy. We're now done with Dune Messiah. And we will move on to... Children of Dune. So, third book, Children of Dune, takes place eight or so years after the end of Dune Messiah. And Paul named his twins, named the boy Leto II, Leto II, and named the girl Ganima. Gani for short. Ganima means abomination in some sort of language. I don't remember. Anyway, so he's got the two kids. It focuses on the two kids. The two kids are really weird because, of course, they're twins. They share all the same memories. They're super duper close. They're basically the same person, but boy and girl. Um, Aaliyah is now leading the empire. She is now the focus of all of this religious imagery because the kids are too sh uh, young to truly take that power. So Aaliyah is now the uh, queen of the universe with Duncan Idaho uh, being her husband. Um... Uh, so, Jessica's been gone for, like, 20 years at this point, but it kind of, uh, children do open up with the fact that Jessica's coming back. Jessica's coming back to visit her grandsons, grandchildren, um, and, uh, Aaliyah suspects that it's, be uh, not just because of that, Aaliyah suspects that she's there to s determine whether or not Aaliyah is truly an abomination that should be killed or someone who should, is, is fine, you know what I mean? Um. Yep. So that's that. Uh, I'm trying to think what happened. I have like very broad memories of this book, but not not, not much specific. Um. So Jessica comes. Oh. Um. 
uh, I guess it, that's covered in like Ganema and Leto 2 have like this really weird relationship that nobody really understands. They have like inside jokes. They talk in like ancient Egyptian, uh, which of course nobody knows the language because it's like hundreds of thousands or like tens of thousands of years years old at this point. Uh, but they remember it because they have all of their past memories. Um, so they have like this weird like tw- uh, from the outside it sounds like a twin language, uh, and then they keep talking about this quote unquote golden path. Right, because they can both see the future, and they're both like, "Oh, we need to follow." I have Leto two basically champions this golden path as being like, "This is the what. This is what we should do." Um, and so that's going on on Dune, and then we we s- cut to Seleucus Secundus, which is basically where Paul exiled the uh, House Carino. And what are the motherfuckers called? Uh, no, 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 no. No, I don't want that either. Give me a fucking synopsis, my man. <laughs> oh shit, I should also say. Um, so during this entire time since Dune, they have been terraforming, terraforming Arrakis to have uh, like plant life and like open water and not just be a, a shitty desert. And so at this point, there are pockets of little, like, gardens with, like, open water that are starting to form. And so, like, it, it's kind of... It's it's ramping up at this point. It's, like, kind of at, like, the point of no return. Or it's, like, if we stop doing everything, it will turn not into a desert anymore. Um, but that's doing that. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Let's see, there's this person called the Preacher that uh, defies Aaliyah's kind of religious government and basically preaches against her. Um, Jessica's coming back. She brings Gurney back, and Gurney instantly goes and does some secret mission for her. Um, What are the fucking... So there's... I forgot the goddamn names. Oh, uh... Uh, there's uh, Princess Wencia, which I believe was Irlan's sister. I believe it's uh, Princess Irlan's sister. So she's uh, chilling on uh, Seleucus Secundus with her son. I forgot the son's name. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, bu- 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 she's she's uh, Benny Jesuit, of course. Oh no, she's not Benny Jesuit. Her sister, yeah, her sister Irlan was tr- Benny Jesuit, but she is not. Uh, bu- 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 oh, that's right. Her son Faridin. Yep. So, uh, Wencia and Faridin are chilling on Solis Secundus. Uh, Wencia is training uh, these things called la- Laz Tigers to kill a small two small twins dressed in the specific clothing um which is dope as hell is this like like super tigers that they're trying to kill um and like obviously that's supposed to mean like uh Ganyma and Leto 2 uh so that's going on um what else is really going on Uh, so Jessica goes and talks to her grandchildren, Leto two and Ganima, and she's like, "Okay, you two are fucking dope as hell. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm cool with you two." Um, and then she goes to talk to Aaliyah, and she's like, "Okay, Aaliyah, you're obviously a fucking bitch. I want you dead instantly." And so she just hangs around Aaliyah, kind of waiting for an opportunity. Maybe not to kill her, but just like just like gathering information. Um, and then Aaliyah has her blatantly has a blatant assassination attempt against Jessica, which kind of provokes a lot of people. To, like there's a split amongst the church of Aaliyah, whether or not Aaliyah is an asshole or not. Um, Leto two and Ganima go out into the uh, open desert. 
uh, and they are attacked by the last tigers, but of course they knew that because they can see the future, and so uh, they fake Leto 2's death, and then Ganema runs away and says, oh shit, Leto 2 died, and she like breaks her mind in such a way that she now believes that Leto 2 is dead in every way, shape, and form. Uh, yep, so Leto 2 is all but dead, Leto 2 gets a worm and rides to this place called uh, Jakarutu. Jakarutu being an ancient Fremen legend, basically saying like everyone should stay away because there's like it's like haunted or some shit. It's like a really bad place. Um, and so th this is his golden path. He's going to Jakarutu. At Jakarutu, he is captured by uh, Granny Halleck and friends. Granny Halleck and some smuggler friends that he has amongst the Fremen. Um, that's that, and he is, oh, he, uh, oh shit, I fucking forgot about this. Um, so basically, uh, Ganema and Plato 2 have been purposely avoiding eating a lot of spice. So they have had a minimal spice diet because they knew that the spice is what drove, drove, well, they think that's what drove Aaliyah to be, uh, spoiler, she is a, she is Abomination. She has been, uh, basically taken over by the Baron Harkonnen. So he's back, but in Aaliyah's body, um, and all he wants, yeah, whatever. Um, and so they, they're like, I don't want spice, because I think I might become an abomination, and then Gurney forces him to have spice, and then so he delves even deeper into his golden path, and is like, okay, so now this is like exactly what I should do. Meanwhile, the preacher goes to uh, Seleucus Gundus and talks to Wencia and Faradin, and then he's like, I will teat, I will, you know. I'll, I'll, no, he, he goes and says, like, I will interpret your dreams. Because Faradin's been having some weird dreams. And and so the preacher goes and says, Oh, uh, tell me your dreams. And then Faradin does. And then the preacher's like, I have now interpreted your dreams. And then uh, Wensi and Faradin are like, Are you going to tell me? And he's like, I told you I would interpret it. Not, I didn't tell you that I would tell you what I interpreted. And so he just leaves like a boss. Um, and then Jessica, after the assassination attempt, flees with uh, Duncan. Because Duncan's like, Oh shit, Aaliyah is now possessed by the Baron Harkonnen. It's now completely abomination. Um... So Jessica and Duncan go to uh, Seleucus Secundus and they're like, I'm going to train Faradin in the Benny Joseph ways. And then Duncan just kind of hangs out for a little bit and then Duncan leaves because he's, he's like, I, I will now betray the Atreides. And so he leaves. Um, what else does du fucking Duncan do? Oh, that's right. Yeah, so Duncan hates the Atreides. Well, uh, not hates, but like he hates what the Atreides have become. He, lo he still loves the heart of the Atreides. Um... And then, so they capture Leto. He goes into the spice trance because they keep forcing spice down his neck. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. He sees he sees the the true golden path. Um, and he sees that his father Muad'Dib, Paul, uh, turned his back on this path. Um, but anyway, he uh, he escapes Jakarutu and basically goes to this other place. Um, and there, he basically, uh, so, let's leave that for now. So, he escapes Jack Rue too. let's leave that. Uh, the preacher is, like, preaching that, like, Ali is a bitch, and she, they should probably kill him, kill her, and then, like, uh, everyone's like, uh, all of Ali's priests are like, we should kill this preacher immediately, and then Ali is like, wait, no, we shouldn't kill him, because that, the preacher might be Paul. Um... Uh, meanwhile, Ganema is under the protection of Stilgar, who is kind of like uh, neutral in the uh, is uh, Aaliyah uh, abomination debate. Um, but Duncan provokes Stilgar into killing uh, him, so Duncan's now dead again, uh, having been killed by Stilgar, which forces Stilgar to go into hiding with Ganema. Uh, because Duncan's like, well, Ali is obviously abomination. I'm never going to be able to convince Stilgar to go into hiding because that will betray his word. So he provokes Stilgar into killing him, which forces Stilgar to flee and break his word, basically. Um, so, back to fucking... Oh, my pizza's here. I'll be right back.
Okay, so... Where was I? Oh, that's right, Jackaroo... Oh, no, uh... Lato 2 escapes, Jackaroo 2 goes to this other place I forgot the name of. But basically this other place has, uh, what are called sand trout. And what sand trout are are basically like these little mushy baby worms. Uh... And so the sand trout go and they suck up water and then burrow underground and then transform into worms. That is why there's no open water on Dune. It's because all the water is held by sand trout underwater. Right? And so basically what Leto 2 does is he surrounds his skin with sand trout. And then because he has perfect, he has uh, Bene Gesserit training, he can uh, change his metabolism such that the sand trout kind of bury, uh, kind of become almost a symbiote with him. And this makes him really strong and, like, really fast. So he can, like, jump, like, three stories. He's, like, Superman, basically. Um, and so he, like, just runs away. Uh, and then Aaliyah is brought to... Uh, not Aaliyah. Um, Ganema is captured from Stilgar. I think Gurney's killed or something. I don't remember. Uh, anyway, Ganema is brought to Aaliyah along with Jessica and uh, Faradin and uh, Wincy is killed because uh, she tried to kill uh, the twins um, so everyone's kind of in this one building the preacher's preaching outside uh, oh shit fuck I forgot so Leto 2 is now like a superhuman he's running through the desert he sees a worm and because of his prescience he knows what is who was on the worm and so he goes and he stops the worm and he can stop the worm because his skin is made of sand trout and a worm will not eat sand trout because that's just baby worms and who is on the back of the worm uh, guess what it is the preacher and the preacher turns out to be Paul all along um, and so Paul's like I can't believe you've done this to yourself referring to the sand trout skin and then Leto's like this is the this is the only way. This is the golden path, and then convinces Paul to go with him to the capital city. I think it's Arakeen. Uh, the capital, whatever. Whatever. Uh, so Paul and Leto two go there. Paul is again preaching. Like, he's like preaching s like specific heresy against Aaliyah, and so Aaliyah's priests go out there and kill Paul. Of course, they don't know it's Paul. So they kill Paul. Aaliyah's like, oh shit, they fucking just killed Paul. Um, and then Leto 2 busts in, like, breaks in down, like, a steel, like a, a super strong door. And then uh, Aaliyah's like, oh shit, I think he knows that I'm actually the Baron Harkonnen. And then so, which I think is really cool to think of, but probably stupid in, in retrospect, Aaliyah tries to fight uh, Leto 2. Because Aaliyah's, like, super trained, because she, she has all of her, like, ancient memories, so she can fight real good. Uh, so she tries to fight, but of course Leto 2's covered in sand trout. Even though he's eight years old, he's, like, strong as fuck. And so he just, like, picks up Aaliyah by her hair and just swings her around so much that, like, it's, like, the centrifugal force forces all the blood out of her brain. And basically just puts her down. He's like, are you going to fight now? And she's like, oh, man. And then um, he basically says, either I'm going to fucking burst your head like a fucking watermelon or you're gonna and then he like opens the door to the balcony and he's like or you can jump off and join your brother Paul and then so she like she like takes control away from the Baron like she like controls the limbs but the Baron still has the head and he's like screaming he's like no don't do it no don't do it and then she jumps off and dies next to Paul um and then so Leto 2 is now the emperor of the world uh, he says, it's like, I'll, I can live for up to, like, 5,000 years now since he's got the cool sand trout skin. Um, Faradin is now, like, a friend, and so the Carinos are no longer a threat. Uh, the Bene Gesserit are basically tamed once again because Leto 2 has, like, complete control over uh, the Spice. The Guild is, is controlled, and then Tleilax is kind of under control eventually. So, like, all is, all is once again, well. Uh, Leto 2 now has f complete control and is following his golden path. So that's basically Children of Dune. Uh, so now we move on to 
probably my favorite of the six. We get to God Emperor. Jesus Christ, that's a bad M. M. How do you spell this? Emperor, not exactly as I, as I thought, as I suspected. <laughs> there we go. Now, okay, God Emperor opens up. It is now 3,500 years into the reign of God Emperor Leto II. He is now a 7 meter long worm human hybrid because the sand trout skin has completely infested his entire being and he is basically a worm man now. Uh, 3,500 years. He has a little assistant called Moneo who is a descendant of the Atreides, uh, meaning Ganema or Aaliyah. No, just Ganema. Um, ba -ba -ba. Uh, he has crippled the entire universe. Space travel is now basically illegal or so uh, prohibited that it's fucking stupidly expensive to do it uh, because Leto 2 has enabled Dune, Arrakis, to become no longer a desert planet. It is now lush. It's now greenery. It's now just like a normal planet. He has the only source of the spice. Right? Uh, so he basically has the entire world under his little boot, under his weird little worm boot. Uh, so that's th that, basically. Uh, and it kind of opens up with um, C uh, Siona. Uh, this, this girl named Siona and like six or seven of her friends are stealing um, number, w number one, the plans to the God Emperor's kind of citadel, the layout, and also some of his diaries. Right, And so they, they're running away. Everyone dies except for Siona. Siona gets away. Um, and it turns out Siona is Moneo's daughter. So Siona is also Atreides, and Moneo is fully, like, basically uh, the assistant of Leto II, the God Emperor. Um, and the God Emperor is, is probably the most, like, philosophical, because a lot of it is like, oh shit, you know, what does it mean to be human? Um, and, like, kind of like the perspective differences because like everyone's like what do you think the god emperor thinks about because like everyone's like oh shit he's so different from us because he's so alien right because he looks like a fucking big ass worm and he's lived for like 3,500 years how could we possibly relate to that you know what I mean and uh um and so a lot of the book is kind of focused on that uh Another opening scene is Duncan Idaho uh, going in, meeting with the God Emperor and trying to assassinate him. And then uh, Leto just kills him. And then is like, we should probably order another Duncan Idaho. Because now, at this point, Duncan Idaho's are being mass produced, basically. Well, not mass produced, but like can be produced for the God Emperor. Because uh, they know the method to um, break the Gola so that he has the memories of Duncan Idaho, right? But it doesn't work for any other Golo. This is specific to Duncan Idaho, so he's kind of like the only person that can be almost resurrected in this sense. So at this point, there's been like... There's been like dozens of Duncan Idahos. Maybe hundreds. But, uh... Yeah, he... Uh, the God Emperor keeps ordering them from Tleilax. who of course, have the Axolotl tanks. Axolotl tanks, which make Golas... Um, what else is there? Um, I'm gonna kind of get through God Emperor because it's, it's really, I mean, it's not a dull read, but it's it, like you kind of have to read it to kind of appreciate it. You, you, like this brief little description is really gonna do much. So I'll get through kind of like the plot. So the God Emperor, uh, is being fought by the rebels, which are led by Siona who is the son, or the son, who is the daughter of Moneo, who is the god emperor's right-hand man, right? And then you got a new Duncan coming in, because he just killed the old Duncan, 
and the new Duncan is being introduced to all of the new changes. And the biggest change is uh, an organization called the Fish Speakers. And what the Fish Speakers are are is uh, the Dukes, the Dukes, the God Emperor's female all female army, and their general huge commander is Duncan Idaho. And so he's being introduced to all the all the Fish Speakers. And all that shit is going on. Um, and then some shit happens. There's a lot of like assassination attempts against the God Emperor. And finally, the ambassador of... Uh, I think it was Ix. Um, does something unforgivable and is banished, basically. And then a new ambassador comes. And the ambassador's name is Wee Nori. And uh, the God Emperor sees it almost immediately. Wee Nori was created to be the God Emperor's perfect waifu, right? So she's like number one. Uh, he loves him with all her heart, all his heart, and she loves him with all her heart. They're basically soulmates, but of course since he's a worm, they can't fuck. And so uh, Duncan kind of swoops in and fucks her, which kind of fucks up a little... It's kind of fucked up, but it's kind of like an act of defiance because Duncan already hates uh, the God Emperor, but he, he is too loyal to the Atreides to really do anything, like directly at this point so uh and then duncan and C uh siona meet and they're kind of like palling around uh and then he talks to god emperor and, and the god emperor is like hey maybe you and siona should have a kid and then duncan's like what the fuck i'm not your i'm not your stud you can't just breed me like some sort of fucking horse and then uh later two's like all right sure whatever um and then through a series of extraordinary events uh, because of the God Emperor's love for We Know Re, uh, they kind of go through uh, this super risky plan in which Siona and Duncan both work together incredibly closely to basically assassinate the God Emperor, right? And when Leto Two dies, and in his 3500 year reign, um, he all of the sand trout that was his skin split off of him and kind of swim away. Um, and so now Dune is, or, or Arrakis is now becoming Dune again. Uh, and then Siona is now kind of like the, uh, there's a, there's a huge, Siona is not the emperor because like, because of the God Emperor's hold, like how tight his grip was on the universe, there's kind of this huge power vacuum that is left. That like can't be just filled by like just a person, you know what I mean? You can't you, like you can't, who's gonna follow up this thirty five hundred year reign of this motherfucker, right? So that's that. Um, that's basically the end of God Emperor. It's it's a fairly simple book in terms of plot, uh, but like a lot of the shit is really really important in the future, uh, specifically in the next book. Uh. uh the next book, which is called Heretics of Dune. Right? That's how you spell heretics, yeah? Yeah, more or less. Okay, cool. So, uh, the first f four... Well, the first three are kind of their own their own book, right? Their own like trilogy. It's kind of the the, the story of Paul Wadi, basically, right, from the beginning to the end. Uh, the fourth one is kind of standalone because it's like that's like uh, Frank Herbert, the author, really kind of fucking puts a lot of his uh, political ideals in there. He's very like libertarian, very anti big government. Uh, at least that's my interpretation. Um, and then the fifth and sixth ones are kind of like their own almost standalone story. They have a lot of an incredible amount of references back to the originals, but for the most part they are kind of their own little thing. So we the the main character now is the Benny Jesuit, right? Um Fuck me, I don't remember a lot from Heretics. Let me get a quick refresher here. I don't remember a lot of the beginning. But basically um Okay, so let me go through a little history. So, after Leto died, after Leto 2 died, now known as the Tyrant by the Bene Gesserit, after the Tyrant dies, um, 
there is this period called the famine because there are no uh, it takes a lot of time for the worms to develop and create oh shit I don't think he ever fucking said it the worms make the spice right and so after Leto 2 dies it takes a lot of time for the worm like it takes like a hundred hundred plus years for the worms to develop to the point that they can make the spice once more uh, and then so that's going on uh so there's a period called the Great Famine, famine referring to the lack of spice, because uh, the only spice is available in uh, Lando 2's Great Spice Horde, which is of course finite, and so eventually they run out um, until the worms start to produce more. And then another thing is that the Tleilax developed a method to create spice in their axolotl tanks. So the Tleilax have a source of spice, and then the only other source of spice is Dune itself, right, at this point. Because Heretics takes place <coughs> 1,500 years in the future, Dune is once again fully uh, fully Dune, fully desert planet. It's now called Rackus instead of Arrakis, it's just Rackus. Uh, there's a lot of cool little you know, tidbits like that, like Caladan is now just Dan. Um, yeah. Uh, there, there's this concept of Atre Atreidesian. Which just means like you're a super charismatic leader that inspires an incredible amount of loyalty from your people. That's now shortened to just Dazian or Dizian. Um Caladan is just Dan, yeah. Uh let's see. So uh we kinda open up. <coughs> Everyone oh uh another thing is uh Leto two was writing these diaries, right, these, these journals, and they were, uh, oh, fuck me, I forgot, okay, oh, man, there's a lot of shit, alright, so, basically, the God Emperor's entire plan with the world was, number one, to keep humans so stagnant that when he died, they would want to explode in exploration, right, this led to an event this led to number one the famine and number two this event called the scattering which basically means humans just fucking exp they just explored everywhere they just left the universe and just went to other planets to, to colonize and just so they just there's like there's like a billion trillion worlds now but they're all they're all separate right you got the main universe the old empire right and then you got the scattering right just people going everywhere you know what I mean just exploring the universe and then so that's number one number two was to continue the Bene Gesserit's breeding program, right? Because the, their original breeding program led to Paul, right? Led to the Quetzai Haderach and the Tyrant. And he took over the breeding program from the Bene Gesserit's, who, I might add, the Bene Gesserit's, he allowed to be alive because he could have easily snuffed them out. But he allowed them to live. But he took over the breeding program, which was resulted in Siona, right? And what's important about Siona, Siona cannot be seen by prescience, right? Her very blood is anti-prescient. So she is, of course, this incredibly important factor. At this point, every single Bene Gesserit has Siona blood, so they cannot be seen by prescience. Um, and then, at this point, 1,500 years in the future, I think that's all the, the history that we kind of need, right? Uh, so the Bene Gesserit are kind of, kind of coming back into true power, quote-unquote power. Like, they're, again, sort of like a... Uh, a more hidden, like, shadow government almost. They're kind of, like, they have a lot of, like, kind of finger holes in every, all the politics and shit. But it, it, they're, they're a lot more forward in terms of their positions of power rather than, like, rather than, like, being, like, the wives of, like, the emperor. They are now, like, they're now more forward. Like, everyone kind of can see beyond them. Um... Uh, and so you got kind of like the three main powers. Uh, the Ixians, who I didn't really talk about, but the Ixians basically have um, created this concept of no-ships. Uh, and what a no-ship is, is basically... Um, or like a no-chamber. It's basically hidden from both prescience and mo like every single form of long-range detection, right? So like radar doesn't pick it up or whatever. They're basically invisible little ships cloaked basically you know what I mean 
So the Ixians can make these no ships. And they also have a way to pilot intergalactic travel without uh, the need of guild navigators, right? So the guild are basically non-existent anymore. Um, so the Ix is a power, the Tleilax is a power because they produce spice, which of course is still really important even though the guild doesn't need it to space travel, even though nobody needs it to space travel. It's still really important because it makes you live like 300 plus years. Uh, and they also have face dancers. And then the Bendy Gesserit, right? Um, those are kind of the three big, big players. Um, but in a, in a twist, these people called the Honored Matres come in from the, sc from the scattering, right? So they come in from outside of the known empire and come back. And what their, their main power is, number one, there's a fucking ton of them. There's like, they outnumber the Bendy Gesserit like a thousand to one. Number two, they're really fast. They can, they can, uh, their main ability is to be able to kick people to death, like real, like real fast, like, w like less than half a blink, you know what I mean? Like really quick. And then three, they can fuck so good that they will enslave any man that they fuck because they're like, oh shit, I gotta get fucked like that again. I'll do anything like that to, to get fucked like that again. Right, so that's their, that's the main, like, big bad guy of these two books is the on Matres, right? And then the Bene Gesserit uh, have uh, Duncan Idaho Gola that they control, right? Um, and so they have, th they're training this, but the Duncan Idaho Gola is still, like, 14 or 15, right? It's like a little teenager. Uh, ba 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 uh, the Mother Superior, which is like the head of the Bene Gesserit, is Terraza. Uh, let's see, Terraza has a, a basically a plan, and that plan is set into motion when they find a girl on Rackus who can control the sandworms, right? And so Terraza's like, okay, so I'm going to send you uh, this other uh, honor, other uh, Reverend Mother. Uh, oh, Drade to um, Arrakis to Arrakis and you're going to train Shiona, w w which is the girl who can control the worms and you're going to fucking get her on our side, right? Because we need those genes, whatever the genes are that can control the worms. We want that. Also, it, it's a huge religious 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 uh, implications because uh, the worms are still revered as gods because it is said that the every worm contains contains a pearl of wisdom from the god emperor and the god emperor at this point is is revered as some sort of god or at least a prophet of god you know what i mean and so that's kind of like what's going on um oh another important character is this guy named miles teg he is a uh, Mentat military commander for the Bene Gesserit. He's smart as fuck. He's like hugely famous because like he resolves conflict without violence. He like his very presence can make the enemy surrender. Uh, he's like he's smart as fuck basically, right? And so Tag is brought out of retirement to uh, lead the garrison of the place they're at that protects Duncan Idaho, the Duncan Idaho Gola, right? Um, a lot of shit's going on. A lot of shit's going on. Oh, uh, through a series of unfortunate events, uh, the Duncan Gola is taken by Honored Matres, and the Honored Matres try to uh, fuck him and make him their slave, but that awakens a hidden talent that he has that was placed there by the Tleilax. That means he, he can fuck as good as the Honored Matres. And basically, he is fucked by this Honored Matre called Morbella, Morbella. But he fucks Morbella so good that they, they kind of both bond with each other. So they're both like each other's slaves, basically. And then they take them both to Arrakis. Teg uh, is captured by the Honored Matres and is succumbed to this thing called a T-probe, which basically tries to read his mind. But uh, something happens, and it kind of breaks, and since Tag has Atreides genes, it kind of unlocks something in those Atreides genes that allows him to uh, be, number one, super smart, number two, super fast. Right, so he breaks out and, like, 
moves faster than the eye can follow. He's like faster than anything anyone's ever seen. He punches all the honored matres on the in the in the thing to death. Steals a no ship with Duncan and Marbella. They go to Dune. They pick up uh, a sandworm and Shiona, the woman who can talk to things, and Odrade. And then Ted goes out and says, "Listen, I'm gonna stand here and be, this is gonna be my last stand. You take." Marbella, Duncan, and Shiona away. Uh, yeah, and then that's basically the end of Heretics. Um, the Honor Mountains come in and they basically glass Dune. And so all of the planet is dead. All the worms are dead except for the one that they have on the no ship that is going back to... Uh, going back to where, you ask? Where, you ask? Oh shit, that's way too big. Where, you ask? Uh, if you said, if you said, that's right, if you said, chapter house, you would be right, because we're moving into the sixth book, fucking finally, chapter house dune, now, <coughs> Chapter House Dune is probably my second favorite. I really, really enjoyed it. Maybe it's because it's the most recent one I read. Obviously, it's the sixth one. Um, it's it's really well done. I really enjoy everything about it. It's good. Uh, it's got a good balance between kind of more philosophical ideas and like political ideas and de some decent action. Um, but yeah, uh, basically, the Honor Matres. I forgot to say in the last one, but the Honor Matres fucking hate the Tleilax. And so they, they, they wiped out Tleilax. Um, the only one who lives is uh, this guy named Waff, I think. Um, I think it's Waff. It might be Sightail. I think it's Sightail, actually. Let's see here. Uh, is it Sightail? Yep, it's Sightail. So uh, they have this um, Tleilax Master Sightail on their ship, and but by Tleilax Master, he basically means he's like he knows everything about the X a lot of tanks. He knows how to make them make spice. Um, but at this point, the Reverend Mothers are the Benny Jesuit are being absolutely fucked by the Honor Matres. Right, they're outnumbered a thousand to one. They're better equipped in like space and shit. And so like all of the planets that. Uh, the uh, Bene Gesserit control are being wiped out systematically. Right, so, like, they have, like, maybe 20 at the beginning of the book, and then, like, at one point they're like, oh, shit, now we only have 16. Oh, shit, now we only have 12. They're slowly being absolutely exterminated, right? Um, so then, I'm still fucking streaming, right? I better be. Alright, cool. Alright, so, uh, the Bene Gesserit are being slowly fucked by the Honored Matres. Uh, they need... Th they're kind of digging their heels in at this point and trying to fight back, um, but they can't. And so they create a Gola of Miles Teg because they're like, we need we need Miles Teg to fight our battles for us because we're not smart enough, uh, militarily at least. And then they have Duncan also there and Marbella. And so they're they're like they're kind of using this Duncan Marbella uh, kind of symbiotic relationship to its fullest advantage. They're trying to both learn everything they can from Marbella and turn R Marbella into a Reverend Mother so that they can learn all of Marbella's secret past, right? Because they don't really know much about the the Honored Matres. So, uh, fucking shit. So, um... <coughs> excuse me. So Duncan Idaho has to stay on the No Ship. So they basically land No Ship. Okay, first, of fir first things first. Chapter House. What is Chapter House? Chapter House is the Bene Gesserit main base planet, right? That is their headquarters planet. They've been there for about 1,400 years. Every person who's ever been to Chapter House and has left a no-ship has had Siona blood, right? So they're, they're invisible to the prescience, and so this entire planet is invisible to prescience, right? Duncan has to stay on the no-ship, because if he leaves, he does not have Siona blood, because of course he, he was born 3,500 years before Siona was. If he leaves the no-ship, they'll be able to see him with prescience, right? So they're like, okay, Duncan is confined to the no-ship, so is Marbella, and so is Sightail, right? So they got the three prisoners in the no-ship. They're 
uh, Marbella and Duncan are kept together. Sidetail is kept uh, segmented off. Sidetail is not really too important here, so I, I don't I don't know if I'm gonna mention him again. Um, Duncan, when he fucked Marbella so good, it actually unlocked his previous Gola memories, right? So he remembers being the original Duncan Idaho. He remembers being Hate. He remembers being all of the well, most of the um, Duncan Idahos that the God Emperor had, right? And so he has basically all of the, a huge amount of past lives to remember. So he's smart as fuck now. Um, what's next? What's next? Um, Rebella is slowly becoming a Reverend Mother. Um, she's being trained, and like because she is, is an honored Matre, she's fast as fuck. And so all of like her physical training is insane because she's like receiving all of this hidden knowledge that the Benny Gesserit have of like body control and like being able to, to control every muscle in your body independently and all that stuff. And also having the speed and reflexes that the Honored Matres have. And so she's becoming uh, quite the force to be reckoned with. Um, oh, I forgot to mention uh, Teraza, the old uh, Reverend or Mother Superior, the head of the Bene Gesserit, died uh, on Dune, on Arrakis. So she was uh, uh, fucking followed up by Odraid, right? Odraid got her memories on Dune and left in the no-ship with Duncan and Shiona and Marbella and Saitel. And uh, so she's now the Mother Superior. She uh, has released the worms, the all of the fucking sand trout onto Chapter House. Hence Chapter House Dune, because Chapter House is slowly turning into Dune. Because right now they don't have another source of the spice because uh, Arrakis was glassed by the Honor Matres. And all of the Chalalags were wiped out by the Honor Matres as well. So they currently have no source of spice. So they're praying to Jesus Christ himself. To, uh, obviously not Jesus Christ himself. Uh, they're praying to Shai Halud or Shai Ten or whatever that the worms take on Chapter House and start producing spice soon. Otherwise they're fucked. Um, because of course they need the spice to be Reverend Mothers. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. what else, what else, what else? So Duncan has all of his memories, he's a Mentat. Um, Teg is like eight years old at this point, or the, the Teg Gola. Uh, and then they force, they, uh, in, in, in a scene that's contr as controversial as that, uh, the, the children fucking in it scene, um, they fuck the ten-year-old Miles Teg so that he uh, gets his old memories back, and and it works. But I mean, at what cost? So Miles Teg is now fucking back, baby. But he's like eight years old or ten years old or something. Um, I'm not even gonna mention the Jews. They're in there somewhere, but I mean, it's it's the Jews. They're there. It's a fucking Dune 6, baby. We're, we're balls deep in this shit. Um, uh, so push comes to shove. Miles Tag and Duncan Idaho both plan a huge attack on um, the Honored Matres. Uh, they execute it. It goes off flawlessly. But the Honored Matres have a secret weapon that can kill just basically everyone in front of them without much work um so they're kind of like Miles Tag and Odraid are captured by the Honor Matres and then um before this attack happened Odraid shared memories with Mirbella who's now a full honored Matre or a full fuck um, a full honored Matre and a full reverend mother now uh kind of like so like she's geared for leadership and so she goes alone to the honored Matres and says like hey listen I have received the the these witches the uh, Benny Gesserit's training and I am also an honored matre please I need to see the great honored matre who is the head of the honored matres and so she does and she kills her and so she is now the great honored matre and also a mother superior because Odraid is killed in in the attack and so she goes back to Chapter House with uh, Miles Teg um and then it's like okay here's the shit and then uh, Shiona who is now a full reverend mother, leaves with Duncan 
uh, and Sightail and a couple worms on the no ship and they go and they leave and that basically sets up the next couple books written by Brian Herbert um, and then I think that's all I'm gonna really get into because goddamn how long is it fuck has it even been two hours yet uh, hour 50 minutes that's not bad so uh, that's basically Dune uh, it's fucking it's okay if you want to watch it you should watch it but if you don't want to watch it that's fuck uh, read it I mean watch it uh, all the media is not not that great so I wouldn't really recommend it but the books are great the audiobooks are fantastic um, Frank Herbert's a genius uh, and that's that see ya fuck off